is, um, you want to tell me when you're ready? Okay. First of all, I must uh, apologize. Um, I haven't taken my contacts out in like a month, and they're really dirty. And um, Mel forgot to print out your introduction, so I'm reading it off my phone. We would like to welcome our District Governor, Greg O'Brien of District 5280. Greg is the father of three and the grandfather of five. He attended his first Rotary Club meeting at, as his high school student body president in 1963 when the school principal took him as his guest to the West Covina Rotary Club, District 5300, is that correct? Wow. Greg later received his bachelor's degree from USC, fight on, and a law degree from Whittier Law School. During his last year of law school, Greg married his wife, Carolyn. In 1980, Greg joined the West Covina Rotary Club later serving as its president in 1988-89. During that time, all three of Greg and Carolyn's children participated in Rotary Youth Exchange, as well as several of his club's international service projects in Tijuana, Mexico. Mex yeah, Mexico. In 1985, Greg was appointed a judge of the Citrus Municipal Court, West Covina, by the governor of California. In 1987, he was appointed to the Los Angeles Superior Court. During his judicial career, Greg held a variety of positions with the California Judges Association and was CGA president in 2002-2003. After retiring from the bench in 2005, he joined ADR Services Incorporated as a private mediator arbitrator. He is now a member of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Rotary Club and was club president in 2012-2013. In 2013, he led RI's first vocational training team in Peace and Conflict Resolution to Istanbul to attend the annual Congress of Mediators Beyond Borders, co-sponsored by District 4140. His belief is that in order to attend, attract and retain members, clubs must constantly refresh and renew themselves and think creatively. Imagine Rotary, he says. Build it and they will come. I welcome Greg O'Brien. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a real pleasure to meet with your uh, board this morning. Uh, I, I am very much in favor of clubs thinking creatively, and I heard some creative things today, including your letters to, to Hoku. I, I'm sure there's no other Rotary Club in the world that has such a project. I think it's wonderful. The Mother Tongue um, project that you have going on in your schools is also another uh, very creative thing. I love the dance uh, for the children that you do that's coming up shortly. And you're, So your club is really thinking very uh, creatively. And that is, the, that is the key ingredient to retaining members and to attracting uh, new members is to think outside the box and so when you do some brainstorming on these uh, three areas I continue uh, continue to uh, think creatively think outside the box things you can do that will make your club uh, different from the way it was a year ago and then the next year you can do the same and the following year you can do the same uh, after that I am uh, I want to talk to you first of all just for a minute or two about some new things that are going on in our district. So we have several new initiatives. One of them is a Rotary Speakers Bureau and so we now have 30 speakers who are Rotarians or about to become Rotarians who are speaking at clubs around the district and they're speaking, on, some of them are speaking on Rotary subjects, most of them are speaking on something else and I encourage you to take a look at our website and go to the speakers and scroll down the roster of the people we have and you might find something that would be good either for a, an e-meeting uh, or for a live meeting here uh, once a month. And the next thing, and, oh, and the other thing is if you are a speaker, if you like to speak, I know Mel likes to speak, if you like to speak, <laughs> Um, and you want to volunteer to be on the Speakers Bureau, there's a subject you'd like to talk about. We would encourage you to join our roster. Uh, the second thing we're doing is called Service Through the Performing Arts. And uh, Benedict Ryder, who's a film composer, musician, 
is in charge of that effort. He is meeting with 30 uh, musicians and, uh, and singers uh, this coming Tuesday night, and they're going to try to get organized, figure out what they've got. Uh, but that is really exciting. We're going to be we're going to be performing. They are going to be performing at district breakfasts and Rotary events, district conference, and so forth. And eventually, we hope to be able to send them out and do some public service such as uh, singing or playing or whatever uh, at, uh, at non-profits, uh, senior sitter, citizen, citizen centers or convalescent homes or places where uh, they can do some great rotary service through entertainments and the art, arts. And then finally, um, we are doing um, a new outreach to young professionals. It's called the Young Professionals Network. And uh, we now have 140 members in the Young Professionals Network. So we've defined young professionals as people who are have not yet achieved, uh, arrived at their 41st birthday. And uh, as I visit the clubs, I ask people to give me their card if they are a young professional, if they're a potential speaker, or they would like to join our musical group. And so we have 140 of, uh, uh, this is maybe the 27th club that I have visited. We've now got uh, 140 young professionals. And uh, Brenda, if you would give me the names of any young professionals and their contact information, they will be invited to special events for members of their generation. And there will be several during the course of the year. We have ones coming up soon. And it's to give them an opportunity to associate with uh, people of their generation who tend to be a more active, have have more active recreational opportunities and so forth that they like to get involved in rather than just sitting at a meeting or sitting at a dinner or sitting at the Hollywood Bowl or uh, sitting at the comedy club. That kind of reoccurring theme that seniors uh, uh, are involved in when they uh, recreate together. So if you're in, interested in any of those things, please see me after the meeting. I want to uh, talk to you today about um, a piece of rotary history. Nancy gave you some rotary history. I'm going to give you some more. I'm just going to start off by saying I'd like you to keep the word imagine in mind. When I was at a conference about a year and a half ago, learning how to become a district governor, every morning I would go to this big conference room, would start off at breakfast, and it was, it was the sign at the, at the front of the room, big block letters that said imagine. <laughs> And I, I really didn't know what the sign meant, but I figured that somebody was going to have a, a speech about Imagine. And every day uh, went by, and I'd look at the sign, and I wouldn't hear anything about this word. And so I began imagining what it was I was supposed to imagine. And I imagined how I could be a better Rotarian, or the things I could do for my club, or uh, the things the district could do differently. And the entire, entire conference went by, and nobody said a word about the word imagine. I said to the fellow next to me, what, what's the sign about? He says, I don't know. Maybe the hotel left it up from the last conference. <laughs> but in any event, it, it stayed with me. I went home from that conference. I could not shake the word imagine. It was like a, an earworm, a tune that gets into your head, and you can't lose it. And I continued to think about this. And so when it came time for pets, this last year, I encouraged our, my classmates to use Imagine Rotary as the theme for pets. And so having said that, keep that sign in mind. We, if, you've, if you've read the newsletter, you see it's now uh, written um, in, in script, and it has a little fellow running through the word Imagine. It's got a kite that says Rotary. That's a story for a different time. I'll tell you at a, the district conference. But just keep that word imagine in mind. Those of you who are Rotarians know about Paul Harris. We heard about Paul Harris today. He was 37 years old, incidentally, when he and three younger friends got together for lunch and they started exchanging lunches at each other's office and said, we ought to call ourselves the Rotary Club because we keep rotating. You know that story. And those of you who are Rotarians know that in 1917, President uh, Arch Klump uh, decided that the Rotary he imagined a foundation. And with $26.50 as the first gift from the Rotary Club of Kansas City, 
uh, the Rotary Foundation was established and well the rest is history, billions of dollars later here we are having almost eliminated polio from the face of the, of the earth and having done so many other great things as well. The story I'd like to tell you about however starts in 1932. In 1932, the United States was in the middle of a huge depression. People were out of work, they were losing their jobs, they uh, were going to uh, soup lines, uh, they were um, losing their cars, their homes. It was a terrible time in America. In Chicago, however, there was a company called Jewel Tea. And Jewel Tea uh, was a big company that made um, powdered drinks, powdered uh, soft drinks, uh, powdered coffee, powdered teas, and household items. And it sold them um, through an order, and then the Jewel Tea guy would come and deliver it uh, to your home, which was very convenient for people who no longer had a car, or maybe there was only one car in the family, uh, who were not able to go to a shopping center, if there even was a shopping center near them. And uh, it was a very successful company, and one can imagine that the president of this company must have been very successful too. Well, of course he was. His name was Herb Taylor. And we have to imagine that Herb uh, was feeling pretty good about life. Uh, he was making a lot of money. He was a member of the Rotary Club of Chicago, and things were good. Across town, however, there was another company called Club Aluminum of Chicago. Club Aluminum of Chicago was just the opposite of Jewel T, financially. Club Aluminum of Chicago was $400,000 in debt, which means that in 1932, they would be the equivalent of $6.5 million in debt. And they were pretty desperate, and they needed a savior. Now, they knew about this guy, Herb Taylor, and they decided they would take a chance because all he could say is no and ask him to come and lead their company. And so they did. You can only imagine what Herb Taylor must have thought when they offered him one-fifth the salary that he was already making. But something about this proposal obviously intrigued him, challenged him, caught his imagination because he said yes. And he left Jewel T and went to Club Aluminum of Chicago. And we can imagine he, he did what all chief executive officers would do. He got to his office, he interviewed people, he looked at the books, he talked to creditors, and uh, he realized that this was much worse than he had anticipated. He actually didn't know what to do for this company. And it really weighed on him because they were counting on him to not only save their company, but to save their jobs. And the thought of all these fine people being out on the sidewalk uh, was very disturbing to him. But he didn't know what to do. So he was a spiritual guy, and, and he prayed. And he said, just, God, give me some help here. I just, I need, a, I need some inspiration. I need a, an idea, a plan, something. Just help me out. And, um, one morning he woke up and he imagined a company that would be the most reputable company in America because it would be so ethical. And in his imagination, the creditors would stick with them and not, and not uh, close down on their debts, that uh, the, the employees would work harder, that the customers would know that they would stand behind their products. And, uh, so he took this to his four senior managers. One was a Roman Catholic, one was an Orthodox Jew, one was a Christian scientist, and one was a Presbyterian. And he said, fellas, I've been thinking about this idea. And I started off with a paragraph, but I didn't want to give that to you because it was too long. And then I reduced it to seven bullet points. I called it a seven-way test. That was too long. I've refined it some more. So I'd like you to take a look at this. I'm calling it a four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? He says, is there anything about this test that is incompatible with your faith tradition? Of course, they said, no. I mean, this is perfect. This is the way everyone should live. 
He said, well, this is how we're going to run our company. Now, Club Aluminum of Chicago made aluminum pots and pans, which were delivered by dealers to the door. The first thing that happened after they made this decision is that the test was tested. Lo and behold, miraculously, Club Aluminum of Chicago received a purchase order for $50,000 worth of pots and pans. I mean, he must have been thinking it's a miracle until he read the fine print because the purchaser wanted to assure itself that it would be paying less for the pots and pans than the price that, that, Jewel, that uh, Club Aluminum sold the items to its distributors, its dealers. And they looked at that order and they looked at the four-way test and they decided that it would not be fair to all concerned. And so they turned it down and waited. They became so obsessed about being ethical, they decided that they couldn't use the word best in their marketing, in their advertising. We can't say we have the best pots and pans because who knows, maybe somewhere else in the country they have better pots and pans. So then it wouldn't be the truth. Honestly, I think if I'd been there, I would have told them, let's not get too carried away with this. <laughs> but I wasn't with them, fortunately. Because fast forward five years, 1937, Club Aluminum of Chicago is still in business. And they are out of debt. And not only are they out of debt, they're making a profit. And not only are they making a profit, they are paying dividends to their investors unheard of in 1937. Obviously, Rotary International knew what was going on. You can almost imagine the conversations they were having. You know, Taylor's on to something. We've got to try this out. Because Rotary International decided it would adopt the four-way test for vocational service. Vocational service uh, was the only avenue of service that Rotary had at that time. So this was going to be the test for people who were in business and professions as to how to run their firms. On the other side of the world, in Germany, Adolf Hitler had come into power. And the German government had been watching Rotary. And the leaders of District 71 in Germany were called in by the government and were informed, we are concerned about your organization. The ideals of your organization are incompatible with German National Socialism. And the Rotarians pleaded. They said, can't you just leave us alone? Can't we, can't we just do our service? We're not trying to hurt anybody. We're not trying to sell anything. We're not trying to propagandize. But the German government would not leave them alone. And so with heavy heart, <coughs> District 71 dissolved. And in Chicago, Rotary International withdrew the charters of all the German Rotary clubs. I want to fast forward now to the year 1943, which I believe was the pivotal year in Rotary for reasons that will be seen as we, as we go along. I think at Rotary International, which had now adopted the four-way test as one of two central pillars of our organization, along with service, noticed something that I noticed about the test. Actually, there is one way in the four-way test that could be the entire test. Because if you're dishonest, if you're not being fair, if you're being selfish, you are not going to build goodwill and better friendships, at least not in the long run. But if you are, you will. Building goodwill and better friendships appears to have become the driving force at that moment in Rotary. Later that year, Rotary International convened a, con a conference with other organizations in London, a very optimistic conference talking about the post-war world. I mean, in 1943, that would have been hard to imagine. But they talked about scientific exchanges and cultural exchanges, group study exchanges, friendship exchanges. And actually, this conference began the framework for UNESCO. Two years later, in 1945, 49 Rotarians representing 29 national delegations, met with others in San Francisco, 
and wrote the United Nations Charter. Winston Churchill said at that time, there are few people in the world who have not heard of Rotary and its good works. Imagine that. Could we say that today, that there are few people in the world who do not know about Rotary and the things we do? In 1947, Rotary established ambassadorial scholars, we call them now Global Grant Scholars, for the specific purpose of building goodwill and understanding among the nations in the world by taking scholars in one part of the world and putting them in a country in the other part of the world and vice versa so that people would get to know each other and exchange things about their own cultures and their own way of living. In 1951, Rotary completed, after 28 years, the final draft of the object of Rotary, which is to encourage and foster the ideal of service as the basis of a worthy enterprise with four subparts. Many of you have this in a, on a plaque somewhere at home or in your office. You don't really need to memorize that. There are three things to remember about it. The object of Rotary talks about service, it talks about ethics, and it talks about building goodwill, understanding, and peace in the world. Rotary had become a peace organization. In 1954, Herb Taylor was elected RI president, and he issued the first presidential theme for Rotary, which was, follow the four-way test. In the ensuing decades, Rotary embarked on billions of dollars of projects around the world for humanitarian relief. And it established the six areas of focus, the first of which is peace and conflict resolution, followed by disease prevention and treatment, water, sanita water and sanitation, child and maternal health, basic education and literacy, and economic and community development. And if you investigate it, you will find that the purpose of the six areas of focus, the mission, is peace and conflict resolution. The means are service. Sakuchi Tanaka, four years ago as international president, called this peace through service, and indeed, Rotary International has established peace conferences and peace forums and peace fellows and peace centers around the world. In the year 2001, the Secretary General of the United Nations called the President of Rotary International, Richard King. Rick had only been in office for a few months. Something terrible had happened. The World Trade Center had been hit. In some places in the world, people were celebrating. We were going to war. There was a lot of anger, hatred, bitterness, and prejudice. And the Secretary General wanted to know, what could Rotary do? And Rick thought about it. And Rick re realized something that all of you know, too. You may just not have thought about it. In Rotary, we speak a different language. In Rotary, we speak Rotarian. Speaking Rotarian means that when we come to our meetings, we leave behind all the divisions of the world, the conflicts of faith, the conflicts of politics, the conflicts of culture, of ethnicity, of race. When we come to a Rotary meeting or a Rotary project, we talk about the things that unite us instead of the things that divide us. And knowing this, Rick King knew that he could count upon Jewish Rotarians in Israel to get together with Palestinian Rotarians in the occupied territories and speak Rotarian and create a model service project. And they did. And they were a gift to the world. You have to wonder, what if all the politicians in Washington had to be Rotarians? Hard to imagine. 
But suppose they were all Rotarians and they met with each other once a week or twice a month or in an e-club and they got together, they left all that other baggage behind and they talked about the things that unite them instead of the things that divide them. They talk about how they're going to make their communities better and they're going to better serve the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the 408 test inspires us, it exhorts us, it defines us, it is our mission. And so I ask you to imagine the way Rick King did, the way Herb Taylor did, the way Arch Klumpf did, the way Paul Harris did. Imagine the things that will lift and inspire and motivate your club, your families, your neighborhoods, our communities, and our world. Imagine Rotary. Build it. And they will come. Thank you.